I invite you to stand for the reading of the Gospel. I mentioned that it's a different one that is printed. We are reading Mark 5, 1 to 20. They came to the other side of the lake, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus has stepped out of the boat, immediately a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs, and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain. For he had often restrained, for he had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him and he shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. He begged Jesus earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now, there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding. And the unclean spirits begged Jesus, send us into the, into the swine. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirit, spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned in the lake. The swine herds ran off and told it into the city and in the country. Then people came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, the very men who had had the legion. And they were afraid. Those who had seen what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine reported it. And they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the men who had been possessed by the demons begged Jesus that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy God has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. For four years, starting with the very first season that Andrew Luck was the quarterback for the Colts, a buddy and I shared season tickets at Lucas Oil Field for two seats. My friend Mike <clears throat> found the season tickets online, being offered by somebody who was disappointed that the Colts had let Peyton Manning go. We picked up the tickets relatively cheap, and with the deal also came the license for the seats, which means we were officially season ticket holders. Mike and I worked at the Presbytery of Whitewater Valley in Indianapolis, and while we enjoyed each other's company a great deal, since we only had two seats, we decided to divide the ten home games between us, picking game uh, designations out of a hat. We had two preseason home games, eight regular home games, uh, and then if the Colts went to the playoffs, we would buy those tickets, and, and for those, we did go together. But so I had tickets to five home games, two seats, and so I would go and take Tracy or one of the boys or another relative or a friend. And we're pretty much into that whole experience. And Mike is quite the researcher, so he always kept looking for maybe a better deal. And so he found us another pair of seats closer and another pair of seats closer. And so we did this for a couple of seasons, getting closer and closer to the field. I mean, we were still in the nosebleeds, but we were closer to the field. <laughs> 
It was so much fun to look at the games, and especially if they won. And some of you are season ticket holders. I know some of you go and enjoy the games. Um, and, and, and even though it's very much in the context of a Hoosier hospitality, there is definitely a home field advantage for the Colts when they play there. You will hear booing for some players from the visiting team, especially if their last name rhymes with Brady. <laughs> we all make a great deal of noise when the visiting team is trying to call a play, especially on those third down and short yardage situations. And then if the Colts are on offense, the stadium gets eerily quiet. And even if you're way up in the nosebleeds like we were, you can almost hear Andrew Luck calling out the play. Ah, and when the, when the Colts score, the stadium is filled with booming music and there's fireworks. It just, and the, and the stands cheering and high fives. It's just so much fun. Away games, that's a different matter. You're out there wearing the visiting team's jersey and you get the weird looks, maybe a little bit of ribbing. As the away team fan, you cheer for your team when no one else is cheering. And it feels like it's you against 70,000 other people, cause it is. <laughs> that healing story that we read today is the first away game for Team Jesus. And while the athletic analogy is going to crumble pretty quickly here in a minute, <laughs> it's a good entry point into the meaning of the story. Palestine was a land occupied by the Roman Empire. And yet Jesus had wandered around in his own area, mostly in places where Jewish people lived. He was a Jewish rabbi. He was teaching at their synagogues. He was healing fellow Jewish people. And for as much as Jesus was an up-and-coming teacher and healer who was beginning to become better known, in the beginning of the Mark Gospel, he essentially only in home turf. Until this story. For reasons which aren't really explained, Jesus and his disciples got on the boat sailed the Sea of Galilee, which actually is like an, in, it, it is an inland um, a freshwater lake. This is the lake where they fished all the time. But they went to the eastern shores. They went to the other place, the other side of the lake. They went to a place where the Romans had conquered another set of people. Over there, Jesus was a foreigner. Over there, even though Jesus is able to speak in either a similar language or at least to find a common language, Jesus and his group of followers were regarded with suspicion and were definitely seen as outsiders. This healing story is the play-by-play -play of an away game. It was a purposeful trip Though again, we don't know why it happened over there. One doesn't accidentally end up on a secluded cemetery where there lived that deeply troubled person. And the details in the story make it clear that this poor man had been abandoned by those who once loved and cared for him. Or eventually had attempted unsuccessfully just to subdue him. In the exchange with the man, we read Jesus was clearly on offense and the man possessed by the legion was clearly on defense. Now, from a 21st century view, one would perceive this poor man's condition to be some significant mental illness, perhaps. But as we let the story speak for itself, we read it was a multitude of spirits which had taken possession of the man. And the possessing spirits used the name legion, which not coincidentally, it's a military term also used by the occupying Roman army. The Romans are occupying the land. The spirits are occupying the man. And from a distance, some folks taking care of the large herd of pigs can hear the yelling of the encounter. And then suddenly, 
the pigs that they were watching over take off like they're possessed. And they drown themselves in the lake. Every other time Jesus healed somebody in some dramatic way, the result was that more people brought their sick people, their sick relatives to them, to him. Not this time. The people were frightened by the powerful stranger whose good deed had ended up costing them money because of all the pigs that had died. And the townspeople begged Jesus to leave them alone. All except for the person he healed. He was wearing clothes for the first time in years. He was himself again. He was safe. He truly felt embraced. He felt seen by Jesus. When others had turned their backs on him, Jesus had met him face to face. And so he asked Jesus if he could join Jesus. But Jesus says, no, you need to stay here and you go tell your friends what God has done for you. If you and I take following Jesus seriously, it means we can't only have home games. It means that we need to, like Jesus, go outside of what could be perceived as our comfort zone. Jesus did that constantly. We just happened to hear this one story. He didn't, Jesus didn't always wait for people to come to him. He is instead going out to where the people were. He knew that he was coming in as an outsider in this story. But in a way, it was his effort to create or to find common ground which could be defined by them, by Jesus and this demoniac. And really, it happens in other places. We just don't notice it because he's going from one town to the next and we just think, oh, you know, he's in a neighboring town. But he's going to where the people are. That effort didn't always endear Jesus to others. But that wasn't the point. The point was that Jesus tirelessly sought common ground and felt the need to go to the home turf of the others. Following Jesus means traveling either physically or emotionally to spaces which are outside of those which, where we spend our lives. We do it not seeing it as an excursion into enemy territory, but as an acknowledgement that Jesus is already there. And we're just following Jesus. It's complex because Societies organize themselves in, at times in really unhealthy and negative ways. The ways which declare that there is a good side and a bad side to the railroad tracks. Ways in which stigmatize a people because of outward appearances or religious beliefs or the size of a bank account. And there goes Jesus into any and all of these places and is asking us to follow, to participate in the healing, in the building of relationships, and in the decrying of societal barriers which divide us. And for as much as I have been writing that home and away metaphor in this sermon, the challenge is that Jesus is asking us to dismantle the difference between home and away the difference between us and them. Jesus refuses to let us hide behind the walls that we create to make us comfortable. Jesus doesn't turn his back on people, and he's not going to let us either. And what's more, the teaching and modeling of Jesus rightly reminds us that our journey of service to one another is to proclaim together what God is doing in our lives and to find ourselves equally impacted by God, rather than assuming that service means that we are bringing the gospel to someone, or assuming that we have the right solution to someone's problems they just hadn't thought about it. The right relationship building overcomes barriers. And it's unfortunately not the kind of thing that grabs the headlines or ends up in the statistics of some well-meaning church or well-meaning nonprofit. In the ministry we do, I work hard not to fall into language of us and them. Because there is no such thing. Instead, I try to think very much about an inclusive us, which is what Jesus is living out. 
The language I try to remember to use is our neighbors, the community, my friends. It's to the point that I try to stay even away from the word visitor when we come to church. I don't know if you've noticed, but I really make an effort that when we welcome people to church, I say, if you're, if you're, I don't say if you're visiting, I say, if you're worshiping here for the first time, glad you're here. It isn't, I'm glad you're here with us. Because that means there's a they and there's a us. I try to remind us that we are together in worship and that's a joy and that's a privilege. And if it's the first time you're here, fantastic. The courageous and daring ministry of Jesus is something that we might wish to tame, but the stories like what we read today make it hard to tone down how hard Jesus is pushing us to expand what we might see as our comfort zone. Because we're in it together, both sides of the lake, both sides of the tracks. Thanks be to God for God's word for us. Amen.